Hello, everyone, and welcome to the London Politica podcast. This is where we join industry thought leaders and experts to uncover the nexus of politics, markets, and society. My name is Modest Chavla, and I'm so excited today to be joined by Dr. David McNair. Uh, Dr. McNair is the One Campaign's Executive Director for Global Policy. He sits on the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, he's also a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Foundation uh, and is a founding executive board member of the Africa Europe Foundation. Dr. McNair, it's so wonderful to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. It's great, great to meet you and great to be here. Yeah, um, we were discussing a bit sort of before this, but uh, you know, I have lots and lots of things to ask you about because you're sort of precisely at that intersection uh, with your kind of background in politics and international affairs, but sort of all this professional background in social impact and in the charity sector. Um, and maybe it's worth starting with a bit of a, you know, a bird's eye view. I saw on your LinkedIn, you were once a, a, a touring musician and an aspiring record producer. What's the story from, from being there to, to getting a PhD, to working in the charity sector for so long? Uh, yeah, it's, well, it's an interesting one. So I grew up in, in Belfast in the 1980s. Uh, which wasn't uh, the most fun place to be. Uh, you know, it was in the, in the middle of the conflict and very kind of insular and everything kind of dominated by this kind of division between Protestants and Catholics and kind of, you know, all of all of that. Um, but, you know, when I kind of started in university, I, I studied geography and that was kind of a really kind of interesting view on the world. Um, and I find it incredibly valuable because it's kind of you know, very multidisciplinary. And, um, you know, we looked at everything from historical geography to, you know, economic geography to political geography. And uh, that got me really interested in, in this idea of kind of connection and segregation and so on. Um, and that kind of led on to, to me doing a PhD on 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 basically post-conflict cities and how, how they are kind of formed and how the planning environment affects how people interact. Um, but that was that kind of almost kind of a discipline of generalism kind of really kind of got me fascinated in the interconnections between lots of different issues. Um, at the same time, I was really into music and, you know, with my friends, I kind of had a band and we toured Europe. And um, actually the best thing about the PhD was that no one was kind of checking where I was. Uh, so I was often, you know, in the tour van writing chapters and kind of editing things and then, you know, playing the show and then going back to the dressing room and doing more edits and so on. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a fun period. But during that period, I also kind of just got so interested in inequalities, why they exist, what drives mm -hmm. them and so on. So I got involved in a number of different campaigns, the Jubilee Debt Campaign, and uh, that resulted in about one hundred and ten billion dollars of illegitimate debt being being cancelled. Um, and then I got involved in another campaign on uh, financial secrecy um, and tax havens and the way that they uh, can kind of facilitate grand corruption and enable, you know, tax evasion and, and the kind of the inequality uh, impacts of all of that. Um, and that was also really fascinating because it kind of made me realize how much impact you can have if you're kind of in the right place at the right time. Mm. So at the time I was working for an NGO called Christian Aid and I was uh, leading that work in Dublin. Uh, and at the time, you know, Dublin was kind of you know, a central part of the, you know, low tax jurisdiction and so on. So we published this report um, on uh, the impact of tax havens. And I was literally kind of torn to shreds on national radio. Um, you know, everyone kind of was saying, you know, this is, these are kind of far right ideas. This is never going to happen. Your analysis is wrong. And then, of course, like the next month, Lehman Brothers collapsed. And right. suddenly that kind of opened up the whole landscape in terms of what was on the table. And within six months, the ideas that we were putting forward were on the agenda of the G20, which Gordon Brown hosted in, in, in London. So early on, you know, when I was kind of in my mid twenties, I realized actually you, you can't have a lot of impact if you know the right people, if you're, you know, if you've got kind of really great ideas and you can find a way of kind of pitching them at the right time. And um, so from there, I kind of did lots more work on, on that issue and then I moved to the one campaign, which um, really is all about um, using great analysis, using kind of popular culture to influence policy and secure really big investments in in fighting inequality and preventable disease. Um, so from there, I've kind of been doing lots of work. Uh, most recently, I've been working on the kind of economic fallout of the pandemic mm. and the way in which the IMF and the World Bank have responded to that, um, but also lots of work on and vaccine inequity and the way in which Europe and the US hoarded vaccines at the start of the, uh, or kind of early on in the pandemic. 
Um, but it's a really, it's been a fascinating journey, but it's all focused on, you know, the kind of the core thread is why does inequality exist and how can you kind of get to the leverage of power to, to change that and address that and empower people in a way that helps them fulfill their potential, you know? Right. Yeah. Sounds like sort of a lot of the work that you've been doing also kind of centers on very distinct, like financial perspective and looking at how money works and where corruption is and uh, how our perspectives on transparency have all kind of in line with that. Um, and I'm keen to sort of hear your thoughts on that, because it seems to me like these are the sort of things that, you know, when big news about a big corruption scandal breaks out, uh, we think about that, we really care about that. It's sort of it's in the headlines for two or three or four days. Uh, but it's never truly enough time for everyone to really digest, you know, how massive a scale it might have happened on. Uh, and one of the things, one of the sort of big reports that you published uh, in, was in 2014 was the trillion dollar scandal. Uh, and again, a trillion dollars is, is the sort of thing which, you know, we can throw around casually, but uh, it's a really interesting part of your report, which said a trillion dollars is uh, in kind of one dollar bills would be a third of the way to the moon uh, stacked on top of each other. I mean, that really puts it into perspective or something like it'd be, if it account to a trillion, it would take you some 30,000 years. Um, I, I find those sort of analogies really fascinating. But uh, when you were, you know, did you ever kind of perhaps initially in your career dealing with these sort of things uh, have that uh, moment of shock when you realize just how, you know, insane some of these uh, scandals really can get. And kind of falling on to that, when you were, you know, involved in exposing these scandals, what was your sort of uh, evaluation of the reaction you got to that? Did you feel like people cared sufficiently about it? Yeah, I mean, when you kind of realize the kind of extent of what goes on um, and the way in which, you know, those who are kind of acting nefariously can basically kind of siphon large amounts of money with impunity. Um, it is pretty striking. Um, I think part of the challenge is how you communicate this um, because, you know, everyone's kind of, particularly after, you know, after the, the financial crisis, which was the time I was kind of working in this area, you know, massive numbers were being thrown out all the time. And they, they almost lose their meaning a little bit, which is why we kind of tried to, you know, talk, to, talk about the dollar bills being stacked up and all that, just to kind of get a sense of the scale. Um, and I think, you know, when you when you look at, you know, the kind of challenges that we're facing, you know, climate change, poverty, inequality, you know, preventable disease and pandemic preparedness, the scale of resources needed to solve those problems is of a different order from what's currently on the table in terms of, you know, discussions about aid and so on. I mean, aid is like, I think about 180 billion um, in, in 2021, whereas you're talking you know, literally trillions to, you know, invest in green energy infrastructure um, to prefer, prepare for pandemics and so on. So um, part of what we need to do is kind of identify, you know, where are those sources of money that we can kind of tap um, in terms of revenues. And, and part of that is kind of channeling private capital, but private capital is good for certain things. It's not good for everything. And, and you know, public capital is, is really important as well. So there's the kind of the, the scale and the kind of how, does, how do you empower, um, you know, countries uh, with the information they need to kind of go after you know, illegal tax evasion, grant corruption, and so on, to get more money to invest in public services. Um, but there's also a kind of much more kind of malevolent and kind of um, almost worrying aspect to this, which is when you have a lack of trust in a system, then that kind of, you know, corrupts and undermines everything. So, I mean, we, we've seen this in, in African countries for a long time. We're now seeing it in, much more in the West, um, where if there's a kind of perception that you know the elites or political leaders are not acting in the interests of the people and aren't kind of acting with integrity, then that kind of pollutes the whole system. Yeah. Then on top of that, if you've got people who are kind of can shape legislation in a way, you know, because of lobbying and because of you know the access to resources that they have, they can then you know shape legislation in in their favor, which then you know further contributes to to inequality. And um, and I was really struck. I mean. There, there's there is a traditional perception that kind of corruption is a kind of thing that happens, you know, in African countries or whatever. Part of what I've been trying to kind of do in my work is to highlight the fact that there's a supply side to corruption as well, and um, mm. that it happens everywhere. Uh, I mean, we've 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 obviously seen that in in um, you know, particularly in, in in the U.S. Uh, with with the last president, but you know the enablers, the law firms, the banks that turn a blind eye. Um, 
many of those are based in jurisdictions that are very familiar to us, you know, the city of London, um, you know, the kind of British link tax havens, the US state of Delaware and so on. So part of what we were trying to do is to kind of, you know, get at the international policy arena to get international agreements that could then unlock or kind of break that secrecy um, and leave it leave fewer places for those people to hide the kind of proceeds of their, their crime. Um, and of course, you know, the most recent stories are, are you know, linked to um, Russian oligarchs and the way that they've been able to kind of deploy their assets in Paris, in London, in New York, and so on. Um, so there are lots of layers to this, you know, the kind of principal one being how do we access more money for the things that, you know, are needed to fight inequality, but then there's the kind of trust in the system and democracy and so on, which if you don't have this these standards in place, then, you know, um, it's everything's weakened. The last yeah. part of your question was this, the response. Um, and this gets back to, you know, what I was saying before in terms of not realizing how much kind of leverage and power you can have if you're in the right place at the right time. So one of the policies that we were kind of pushing, you know, around the time of the London G20, which was kind of responding to the to the financial crisis, was around breaking banking secrecy um, and particularly tax uh, authorities, you know, automatically sharing their information on the assets that they hold with other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, at the time, you know, there were lots of kind of lobbyists you know, arguing against this, you know, saying, you know, the money would, you know, privacy concerns, you know, um, people in some countries would face risk of kidnapping, all of these kinds of stories. And um, actually, none of those kind of transpired to be major issues. Um, and the policy that we proposed was implemented. Mm. And I recently saw an academic study that suggested that countries have raised an additional $100 billion as a result of that policy being in place. So if you think about, you know, the scale at which you can kind of, if you have these kind of ideas, if you can get the right people on board and get them implemented, you're talking about a scale of finance that, you know, is is pretty significant and can get to some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, so I think I think it was kind of pretty powerful campaign. And, you know, there's, there's lots still to do in that agenda. Um, right. But it kind of taught me how, um, you know, if if you're kind of playing in, in if you have great ideas, if you have the right people on board, then you know you can you can make a lot of impact. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, like I was sharing with you before, I mean, we've done some work on uh, the G7, G20, and kind of elevating the concerns of different charities uh, in that realm, particularly the G7 conference that happened in Cornwall. One thing I noticed um, was that uh, the the way to engage with some of these decision makers is almost never through the most sort of uh, formal or laid out bureaucratic routes that they've made themselves, because often the way that they work, uh, they're engineered and kind of uh, sort of top down designed precisely only for their purposes. Uh, and so, you know, the G20 will have a number of these engagement groups, and one of them is the Civil 20, the C20 of uh, 20 different civil society actors. There's the, the B20, the, the Y20, uh, et cetera. But, uh, you know, we did some academic research into this and uh, worked with some scholars and really found out that a lot of the decisions that these engagement groups were meant to feed in on uh, were made before, you know, their reports or their assessments were even received by the mainstream uh, G20 group. And so, again, they become the sort of, uh, you know, it's not greenwashing per se, uh, but, but the sort of uh, this optics game about, yes, we're engaging these stakeholders and we're engaging with a diverse multilateral uh, institutional head. I'm wondering if, you know, you ever saw um, kind of a bit of that, uh, but also as a second part to that, um, on, on kind of this response, I, I feel like, and I could be wrong about this, but there's always this sort of double-edged sword when you're exposing all this, you know, this corruption and embedded inequality in these systems where it could go the right way. Uh, and you could, you know, show the G20 that there's a very concrete policy measure that they should take and it would benefit them and then they do it. And that's spectacular. But what, what happens when you're not able to you know, maybe get certain legislation or policy uh, things passed on. Uh, and meanwhile, you sort of expose this, this uh, you know, kind of almost insane degree of corruption in a certain country or in a certain program or a certain type of aid, development aid. Uh, do people ever look at that and become even more cynical and think, you know, if this is all corrupt and if the money isn't going where I thought it would be, then what's the point? 
Um, Cause that to me would seem like almost a sort of layman mainstream response uh, to me hearing something about, like that in the news. Um, and, and is that, and so you're completely right like about sort of figuring out the communications around that. Is that, how, how do you sort of think about that? Yeah, well, two, two parts to the question. So maybe the, first, the, the second part first. So the kind of public perceptions of, you know, support to, you know, emerging markets and, and aid and so on. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that, you know, much of aid is incredibly effective um, and it is more rigorously evaluated than, you know, many, many other parts of public expenditure that are much, much greater in, in, in volume. Um, but of course, when you're operating in high-risk environments, you know, things will go wrong and so on. Yeah. Um, I think part of what we need to do is to kind of have a more um, nuanced approach to like how change happens. Um, you know, aid can, can um, you know, be very effective in supporting low-income countries that can't raise revenues themselves in, you know, if supporting public services that are essential like education and health and so on um but there are lots of things that aid can't do and it's you know a relatively kind of small volume and can in comparison with you know public finance more generally tax revenues uh, and private finance so i think like just kind of avoiding kind of telling the story that you know, aid is going to solve everything or that it's all going to, going to be perfect mm. is is really important um and helping people understand, you know, the risk of, of the environment. I mean, any business person, if they're, you know, making an investment, they're going to evaluate the risk of that, mm. um, you know, the likelihood of returns, you know, risk is a core part of, you know, how you evaluate anything. But we don't really talk about that in, in the context of aid, despite the fact that aid is used in the, some of the most, you know, risky environments and kind of volatile environments. Um, but in terms of um, your kind of broader question about influencing policy processes i mean you're you're absolutely right you know there is a lot of theater around um these international processes that doesn't really have a lot of impact at all um and part of what we do and as a kind of campaigning organization is to kind of take a very kind of um almost like surgical approach okay what's the decision mm -hmm. that we want to be changed who holds the decision making power who do they listen to and what kind of credibility do those people have? What's the kind of broader environment in which, you know, the things that those people might say to the decision maker, you know, take place? Um, and then how do we kind of pull all those, those levers? So it might be that, you know, it's a finance minister that has a decision over a particular investment. Um, so you might seek to get a meeting with them. You might seek to influence some of the kind of decision makers around them. You might, you know, seek to kind of have thought leaders place opinion pieces in influential publications like the Financial Times or, you know, The Economist. Um, or there might be kind of, you know, a broader kind of public outrage about an issue that a politician has to respond to. And then you can be there saying, well, here's the, here's a kind of solution. And there's a really good example of that. It's kind of, it's almost kind of uh, funny looking looking back at it. But um, in 2013, the UK was hosting the, the G8. David Cameron was the, the prime minister. Um, and about six months ahead of the G8 summit, um, there was a big story that broke in the UK about Starbucks avoiding tax. Mm. Uh, and David Cameron at the time, you know, famously said, you know, companies that are avoiding tax need to wake up and smell the coffee. He made that speech at Davos. Um, so at the time, you know, we were in touch with, you know, the cabinet office and his team kind of like shaping the agenda. Um, and we had this anti-corruption measure, which actually didn't respond to multinational tax avoidance at all um, but it was a really important part of the anti-corruption agenda so we kind of got that to his team and a particular academic in Oxford who he was listening to um, and he kind of put that forward as a as a part of the, the, the G8 and that became a core part of the G8 agenda as we got closer to the the moment we were kind of like you know trying to influence shape the media you know get the right kind of publications in place get the right meetings it transpired that David Cameron wasn't going to make a final decision on it unless the Chancellor was also on board. And the Chancellor wasn't going to make a final decision unless he heard that the Confederation of Business and Industry wasn't going to mm. criticise it. So a lot of what we did was kind of get to the Confederation of Business and Industry. And I think there was a one-line email that the head of the CBI sent to the Chancellor that mm. then said, OK, well, that's OK, I'll move forward with it. That then unlocked David Cameron, who put on the G8 agenda, who made it an international agenda issue. Yeah. So it's it's really interesting. You kind of have to, 
find out where the power is, where the blocks are, and kind of mm -hmm. take a surgical approach to addressing those. Um, because as you say, if you're feeding into a process that kind of reports after the decision has been made, then you know it's completely, completely worth yeah. it. It's it's also the the reflection on some of these meetings that uh, you know so many of these decisions are taken on the sidelines and these backroom channels and these sort of off the cuff meetings that really aren't part of the official agenda ever. Uh, and it was certainly something that we studied was. Uh, the massive difference it caused when the G7, G20 went online uh, during the pandemic very briefly, uh, and the sort of big opportunity loss that that was for uh, the kind of actors that don't have mainstream representation to be able to affect change in those processes. Hmm. Um, but it certainly is very interesting to, to be able to kind of create that chain in as uh, precise a way as, as you know your team managed to uh, back then. Um, but but I'm, I'm really kind of uh, also sort of struck by remarks on risk and, and how we think about that in, in the aid environment, because that's sort of exactly what we do. Um, and uh, kind of the reason I started London Politica was kind of after my evaluation that, uh, you know, the broadly the financial sector, the insurance industry, the big hedge funds, uh, the venture capitalists, like they really care about risk because their money is on the line. Uh, and their paychecks are connected to the money that's on the line in a really particular way. Uh, and they therefore have hired a number of very experienced uh, and very professional risk consultants who build these cool models, who have very sort of interesting, robust methodologies and charge often exorbitant amounts for that, which, you know, than otherwise afford. Uh, it didn't seem to be the case in the aid, the development sector, even though we're talking about similar sums of money, it seemed like there's a more laissez-faire, a more relaxed approach uh, to how we did things and, and how we invested money, uh, broadly speaking. And there's a similar pattern on the lobbying front, whereas obviously, you know, the lobbyists that a Wall Street bank could afford will obviously be way, way more better funded, perhaps better resourced than the lobbyists a certain sort of international advocacy campaign could. Um, what what sort of has your insight been on that, kind of seeing that world firsthand? How large is that gap really? Um, and what do you have any ideas on how to shrink that gap, that sort of uh, skills gap or resource or financing gap between the lobbying uh, and risk uh, evaluation priorities of, you know, corporates, big banks versus charity, social impact? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the first thing to say is that there is a lot of um, great knowledge, professionalism and expertise within the kind of NGO sector. Um, a lot of people who are and, and networks on the ground that are kind of seeing things that others wouldn't. Um, and there are also kind of great analytical networks, um, you know, on the political side, you know, think tanks like European Council on Foreign Relations that I'm part of, or, you know, on the kind of country level side, like Crisis Group, who do kind of like really, really detailed, you know, analysis and kind of make that, you know, freely available to, to NGOs and others who are operating in that environment. Um, so there, there is a lot of stuff out there, um, but I think on the resourcing front, and particularly when it comes to influence, a lot of it comes down to politics, um, you know, where, where you've got a government that is kind of predisposed to your agenda, and you've got access, and you, you are a voice of credibility, you can mm -hmm. kind of really speak into that, um, and quite often on the kinds of issues that we're working on, um, we're actually on, you know, certainly I would believe we're on the kind of moral right side of the argument. And there's a huge amount of power to that, that, you know, millions of dollars of, of lobbying cash can't, you know, can't compete with. Um, however, there is a kind of professionalism, there's a kind of access agenda, there's all of that, that I think, you know, needs to be, be addressed. And, and part of what, you know, at the one campaign, part of what we try and do is, you know, have those contacts be as professional as possible. You know, when, whenever we started out, our co-founder, Bono, uh, had this analogy which is, which is slightly less relevant now, but at the time he said, we want to be the NRA for the world's poor, the National Rifle Association. Uh, and at the time, the National Rifle Association, you know, was, you know, a credibly um, effective lobbying outfit. Mm. Um, you know, any politician in the US knew that if they, you know, changed policy or supported a policy that was against their agenda, they would pay a cost because there would be people, you know, phoning up congressional offices, there would be, you know, protests, all that kind of thing. Um, and Bono's vision was actually that there would be someone on the other side of that agenda who would be acting for the world's poor, 
and we you know that politicians knew that if they cut aid or if they kind of implemented a policy that was kind of not in support of inequality that there would be protesters that there would be people calling their office that there would be you know petitions and so on so i think you know balancing that out um, and kind of being effective and kind of almost quite relentless in kind of defending these interests is really important and that's kind of part of the role that that we need to play final point is i think you know a lot of people don't realize the influence and the power that they can, they can have. Um, I mean, the, you know, the best example recently is Greta Thunberg, who, you know, was on her own sitting outside her, her school um, for many months. And because of the kind of her courage and the strength of moral voice and the issue that she was addressing, suddenly, you know, over time, there, was, there were, you know, millions of people, you know, shaping a whole agenda, you know, that her, her protests kind of pretty much shaped the European parliamentary elections. Um, in, in the last cycle. So I think, you know, when you speak with courage, when you kind of speak up and you speak with others, you can have a huge amount of power. Um, and that moral voice, that moral clarity, I think, you know, is a kind of really powerful voice that can kind of stand up against, mm. you know, special interest groups and kind of well-resourced um, lobbyists and all the rest. Yeah. No, that's, that's yeah, uh, that you're right about that sort of moral force of character holding a sense of value that money can't really compete with hmm. um, because it's also interesting that the sort of amount of coverage that uh, these you know scandals and exposés will get uh, just you know by sheer force of being so kind of morally uh, moving uh, that uh, you know a lobbyist or a big company would have to pay off you know tons of people to get that sort of influence and pay communications companies and pay lobbyists um, I'm wondering, kind of, with the sort of many years you spent in the sector, uh, there seem to be, I'm sure, sort of patterns of risks that emerge all the time and uh, certain similarities in the way that things are done that uh, almost kind of become templates for you when you look at them and say, you know, here is a pattern of a certain sense of wrongdoing or something else. Um, but what's the flip side of that? Do you, do you think there are certain risks, certain, uh, you know, things to watch out for? Uh, that broadly speaking, the aid development social impact sector isn't paying nearly enough attention to is, is just not being kind of called out as much as it should be. Um, and if so, you know, what, what what are those sort of things like? Well, I think, I mean, we're, we're, we're living in an era of kind of almost non-linearity. And, mm. um, you know, a lot of the issues and kind of risks that have shown to be, you know, societally and economically, um, and, you know, in terms of mortality, you know, those risks have kind of come out of nowhere. COVID-19, you know, the war in Ukraine, um, you know, a lot of the kind of extreme weather events associated with climate. And um, so I think, um, you know, pl plotting out and kind of like mapping what might happen, I think is kind of, is becoming more and more challenging. But what is also kind of clear is like how everything is connected. And I think the risk in particularly in the NGO sector, is that um, it's very, very um, siloed in terms of issue. Mm. So you'll have a whole kind of education community that kind of is obsessed by the kind of policy details of education. And then the same kind of conversations happening in the health community, the same in the anti-corruption community. Uh, and suddenly, you know, you've got all these kind of communities that are kind of talking to or kind of preaching to the converted in some sense. Or kind of really focused on the kind of detail of their issue and not seeing the bigger picture, which is that, you know, these kind of events that are completely out of, outside of our control are completely shaping politics. Um, and when you have an absence of leadership on these mm -hmm. issues, then it's very, very difficult to get anything done. I mean, we saw that, you know, during COVID, you know, despite the fact that it was very, very obvious that this issue, um, you know, a virus that doesn't respect borders, um, you know, completely disruptive on society, you know, millions of deaths, mm. trillions in terms of economic cost. Political leaders, particularly in Europe and North America, didn't have the foresight or the vision or the political space to, to treat this as a global problem. They treated it as a domestic problem. Mm. You know, countries bought up as many vaccines as they could to protect their own populations, you know, you know, not addressing the, the risk of variants in other places and all of that. And then that then has kind of led into kind of a politi you know, a, more of a kind of geopolitical fracturing, I think, mm -hmm. um, where a lot of African leaders, 
were kind of really, really burned by that experience because previously I think there was an assumption that um, Africa could, in some senses, count on Europe and North America in times of need for support, economic support, health support, and so on. Um, and COVID showed that that is just not true. Um, and I think that's now playing out in the response to you know Putin's invasion of Ukraine. A lot of Europeans were shocked at the U UN General Assembly votes. There mm. were there were three two condemning Putin's actions and one to eject Russia from the UN, UN Human Rights Council. Um, and almost half the countries that abstained from those votes were African countries. Um, and a lot of Europeans were like, well, you know, I thought these African countries were our friends, you know, we're giving all this aid, why aren't they supporting us? Uh, and the African viewpoint is entirely different. It's one of, you know, you know, we're facing challenges, we need partnerships, we need to keep our options open, but we also don't want to take sides in other people's wars. And we see a lot of hypocrisy from, from you know, other countries and in, in how they're treating this versus how they treated other you know, wars and so on. So I think I think an awareness of the interconnectedness, mm -hmm. an awareness of how events can shape politics, um, and you know, looking at these kind of broad trends of of kind of geopolitical fracturing are something that I think um they're all issues that you know should be kind of regularly baked into how we think about our strategies, whether mm -hmm. that be something on the you know, you know, education or health policy, whatever it might be. Like it's all within this environment where the success of that like particular campaign is in, almost entirely dependent on these broader forces, and we need to kind of you know be mindful of those and kind of work within those forces. Yeah, and also you know find moments of, you know, I, I think you know the past few years have been kind of very very challenging. It's almost everything that kind of hits is like another, mm. um, you know, negative you know headwind that makes things more difficult. But there are also opportunities to kind of turn that around and make the case or kind of find chinks of light where you can make progress. And yeah. I think it's up to us to kind of try and identify what those are. Yeah, no, it's so fascinating to me that you say that because you're not sort of, you know, the first person to say that on the podcast. Uh, the last guest we had uh, was an assistant secretary general at NATO and uh, kind of along a similar line. He said the biggest problem perhaps in NATO and within international security is precisely this kind of siloing of the way we look at risk. Yeah. Um, and it's looking at it through these often outdated, often uh, too obscure and too kind of, uh, you know, pigeonholed lens, uh, lenses of uh, uh, different things where we can't really see how the dots connect between them. And it's precisely in the way that the dots connect that the solutions to those risks lie. Uh, and I think the second part of your answer uh, is, is, is a perfect example of that, because if it really is all about uh, if, if, you know, kind of defeating Russia and garnering international support against it is all about uh, uh, creating a global community and, uh, you know, really including the voices of the countries in the global south and in Africa, uh, then, you know, there is a perspective to how we're handling aid and, you know, where Africa ranks on our list of priorities. Uh, and where possibly it might have been neglected given, you know, the pandemic and given Ukraine and given other things. And so uh, perhaps neglecting, you know, African concerns, priorities, aid uh, because of, uh, you know, or sort of overlooking them solely because of what's happening in Ukraine is in fact detrimental to Ukraine itself uh, is, is the big kind of takeaway from that. And I think uh, the interesting point here is, is um you know, the, the example of, of the last you know, person on your podcast, I, I think what Ukraine, what Putin's invasion showed us was that, you know, NATO and the West are very good at responding to the threats, you know, kind of traditional threats, mm. um, as they would have in the 1950s or whatever, you know, drop bombs on the eastern you know, flank of Europe. And suddenly there's, you know, billions of dollars invested, you know, a, a reunited transatlantic alliance and so on. But when we look at other kinds of threats, you know, viruses, misinformation, um, you know, the the weaponization of technology, like we don't have that kind of um, united front. Um, you know, countries are kind of treating it as, you know, treating these issues, you know, a climate is the kind of, of course, the greatest one, where countries kind of treat these issues as, you know, um, these are national issues, and then if there is an is if there is an international element, it's a kind of afterthought, or it is a kind mm -hmm. of charitable endeavor, rather than a core part of the threat facing us. And um, if we were to treat climate change like we treat 
um, traditional security threats and bombs and so on, yeah. we would be investing in an entirely different way and having an entirely different conversation. Yeah. Um, but we're not doing that. Yeah. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's what the sort of the, the, the merger of the, you know, the development and the foreign office wings is all about, right? Um, but it also kind of strikes me as uh, in, in certain pockets of decision making, perhaps there is an over reliance on that belief. And so, you know, if you look at the way the IMF uh, and lots of these global institutions have been criticized for the way they give out aid and give out loans, um, that kind of neoliberal paradigm of loan conditionality uh, has, you know, really been a focus of much critique. And I'm trying to see there's a parallel to a kind of geopolitical conditionality uh, in the way that countries conceive of aid. Um, and whether, you know, if we almost think too much from the lens of uh, kind of looking at Africa, not as, you know, this is the moral case for supporting its people get out of poverty uh, and electrifying their grids and giving them access to clean water, but rather thinking about them as an instrument in some broader geopolitical game that's not, you know, concerned to them. Um, you know, that might be, it's, it's an interesting communication thing because we can kind of sell that narrative now say in the case of Ukraine, but long term, it needs to go back to, you know, the moral case, it needs to go back to their needs and their priorities. Um, yeah, is there is there a potential issue there, do you think? I mean, it's a, it's a massive agenda. So I think I think the first thing to say is, you know, the demographic, I mean, dem demography is destiny. Um, and, you know, the demographics in Africa are going to be a huge, huge kind of, um, you know, trend that like impacts our whole world. And um, so, um, I mean, if you look at the statistics, um, you know, I think it's by 2038, there'll be as many young people in Nigeria as in the whole of the European continent. Um, so um, there, there are economic impacts to that. You know, you've got, you've got an aging European continent with, you know, pension costs and all of those issues, you know, economic dynamism. And then you've got, you know, a young Europe, uh, African population and with you know huge amounts of kind of creative energy and right. um, you know i think that'll change the kind of political dynamics you know the more and more the young people are just demanding demanding political reform from their geriatric leaders and um, but then there's the kind of how they perceive other partners there was a really interesting study it published in june by the akovitz foundation and it basically looked at you know young people's views across africa mm -hmm. and for the first time the superpower that they most recognized and most respected was China over the US. And I think that's partly because China has been so visible with its infrastructure projects. But I think it's also a kind of sense that um, China is a kind of alternative model that actually has lifted, you know, you know, millions and millions, potentially billions of people, people out of poverty. Um, and they, you know, they aren't asking questions, whereas they perceive the US and particularly Europe as kind of preaching, you know, you know, giving aid in a kind of paternalistic way. Yeah. Um, and that's not what's wanted. They want, a, you know, a genuine seat at the table. They want, you know, a, a sense of kind of forging their own mm. their own um, future and their own destiny. Um, and you're seeing that now with uh, Maki Sal, who's the currently, you know, Senegalese president, but currently chair of the AU. A lot of the issues that he's putting on the agenda are, you know, structural reform issues. So, for example, the way in which um, credit rating agencies um, allocate risk to African countries and therefore they have to pay more on capital markets for borrowing money. Um, you know, they're looking at um, and calling for an African, you know, a, an African Union seat at the G20. Mm. They're talking about reform of the World Bank and the IMF so that Africans have a more kind of genuine decision-making seat um, because the proportion of the voting share is not at all in line with their proportion of the population. So I think I think that kind of dynamic of kind of African assertiveness on the geopolitical stage um, um, and not just being a kind of, a, you know, a passive charitable recipient of, right. of European or African aid, like that boat has already sealed. It's kind of, it's happened, but a lot of Europeans and North Americans don't realize that. And I think they need to. Yeah. So much of this is about uh, asking Africans about African priorities, which seems like a common sense thing to do, but so often is one of the biggest issues when we look at these things. I mean, Ukraine is another great example, right? Like how many kind of policymakers, uh, thought leaders, uh, sort of international commentary, really thinking about uh, what the average Ukrainian 
uh, citizen or policymaker thought about their condition. And instead, I, I felt like sometimes kind of uh, the commentary around it became very disconnected and became sort of too much about, you know, this geopolitical game and Russia and, you know, these big powers uh, kind of using it almost as their backyard. Uh, I mean, I had the chance to go into Ukraine a couple of months ago, um, and that was kind of the biggest sort of shift in, in uh, realizing that so many of the things on the ground uh, really are motivated by local politics and by local concerns and these sort of grassroots mm -hmm. things that we can often never understand kind of sitting behind the laptop in London. Yeah, um, uh, yeah no, certainly very, very interesting conversation. Um, I, I always like to kind of end off uh, these, because uh, inevitably, given the state of the world right now and risk and, and aid and geopolitics, we talk about a lot of sort of frightening things almost, right? Things that mm -hmm. might make us uh, feel a little bit pessimistic about the future and about the way things are going. So I love to always ask, is there one thing uh, that you think is overlooked uh, that makes you optimistic about the future? I mean, I think if you look at the long term or the kind of medium term trends, there's a lot that has, you know, really positive that has happened in the last few decades. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you look at child mortality, um, maternal mortality, extreme poverty, you know, it's pretty remarkable what has happened. Um, uh, and I think ultimately, you know, human um, kind of creativity and ingenuity kind of driving those things forward will, will ultimately be a kind of force for good. Um, and I think a lot of what we're kind of experiencing now is... Um, you know, in some respects, you know, the economy is completely changing. We still haven't got effective, you know, rules and regulations to manage, you know, what has now become like an internet digital economy. Um, and, and it's almost like the industrial revolution. Like we need to kind of you know, go through that period where, you know, there will be like massive winners mm -hmm. and huge inequality created by it. But as, as things balance out, you know, the kind of prosperity that's created by that, you know, those new forms of industry and kind of economic patterns will will um, ultimately i think benefit everyone um, but yeah there's a, there's a lot of kind of uncertainty to go through and it's a kind of it's a very worrying period uh, if you kind of if you think about um, you know all the kind of threats that are uh, that are with us but ultimately i think you know humans are a force for good they want to help one another by and large um, and if you look at you know the examples of people in local communities you know looking after one another, looking after their families, like that's the ultimate kind of force that's driving most of us. Um, and if that can kind of ladder up to a societal um, shift, then, oh. then that will be a very, very positive thing. Yeah, no, it seems like the, the case for optimism and the case for the most pressing answers are both in taking the big picture. Uh, what a nice note to end on. Uh, Dr. David McNair, thank you so much uh, for being with us on the show. Thank you, Manis. That's all for this episode, folks. Uh, to find out more about London Politica, please follow our LinkedIn uh, or visit our website, www.londonpolitica.com. Uh, and I'll see you next time. Stay tuned and stay safe.